here. Um, I was actually excited about the possibility of her doing something on Gustav III, because Swedish theater is something that we never study. And uh, unless you're doing the Drotten Home, you don't get a chance to find out just the amazing stuff they've done in Sweden. Um, well, I suppose Strindberg is the only other person we might know um, who was Swedish. But, uh, but then, then I discovered how little people know about the Russian theater, especially in this period from right after World War I to the beginning of World War II, when just the most amazing stuff was going on. And so as part of this year of studying festivalization uh, with the Triumph of Isabella, I asked her if she could talk about Bakhtunov because there's some new material that has come out on him and uh, we don't even cover the old material on him anymore. And so I thought it'd be a great opportunity for people to get to hear about some really exciting work. So I'm just gonna turn it over to you. You have control of your slides right there. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you. First of all, I would like to say that I'm extremely happy to be here, and I would like to thank Frank for inviting me. I'm happy to present the art of Evgeny Vakhtangov, the Russian stage director. You may not know him, and it's not surprising, but trust me, he's an important figure in Russian theater. And I come from Moscow. I've been a spectator of Vakhtangov's theater since I was little, and then I studied Vakhtangov at the Russian University. So I would like to offer you my Russian perspective on this stage director. And as you may realize, I'm not a native speaker, so I apologize in advance if I mispronounce some words, but I'll try to do my best. So, Let's start our journey and relocate ourselves to the city of Moscow during the winter of 1921-1922. The Civil War has just ended. The entire country is deeply mired in an economic crisis. People don't have food to eat or wood to warm their houses. No one is sure about their future. Everything feels very grim and hopeless. The famous Russian stage director Evgeny Vakhtangov's production of Carla Goss's Torn Dot has its opening night performance amid such gloom. The event happens on February 28, 1922, in a small theater on Arpad Street, in the center of Moscow, my hometown. Princess Torn Dot was Vakhtangov's last performance. The still young stage director was in the final stages of dying from cancer. Given the dire situation of Vakhtangov and my country at that time, it must have been shocking for his audience to experience the light and festive spirit of this performance. Vakhtangov's torn dot offered them hope for a better future by plunging them into an atmosphere of theatrical joy and happiness by way of an immersive theater experience. Although the show lasted only three hours, for the audience it seemed timeless. It stretched the boundaries of theater by powerfully manifesting the idea that theater is simply theater and not an imitation of life. Moreover, such a theatrical experience had the uplifting and life-changing power to defeat their dismal exterior reality and turn the event into a stunning celebration of theatrical art. Just imagine men in fancy white ties and women in evening dresses performing on stage. Nadezhda Lamanova, the best Moscow fashion designer of that time, created these costumes. For funny Commedia dell'arte characters made pranks and told jokes during the action of stage, on stage, adding a playful ambience to the performance. This set of fun surprises is a bit similar to what you may felt with Commedia dell'arte characters outside in the hall during the triumph of Isabella experience. The artist Ignaty Nivinsky created the stage design. In the spirit of constructivism, Alia Kandinsky, 
brightly colored material served as the actors' costumes, beards, and headpieces. Here we can see actors putting on costumes, and here are some costumes. Vakhtangov wanted the audience to become involved not so much in a fairy tale China, where Prince Kalaf was struggling to win the heart of the capricious Princess Turandot, but in a theatrical China, where the actors not only performed their characters, but also could step out of a character to offer an opinion about them. Irony became this production's main artistic method, while its main theme rose up as the joy of acting and the triumph of theater. Vachtangov revealed theatricality, the playful and happy side of theater. However, its external form co coexisted with the inner truth of the characters. By producing Turandot, Vachtangov directly opposed his teacher, Konstantin Stanislavsky, one of the founders of the Moscow Art Theater. Yet at the same time, paradoxically, proved to be Stanislavsky's most faithful student. To better understand how Vachtangov reached this point, indeed, how Vachtangov became Vachtangov, and went from presenting naturalism on stage to establishing his ultimately unique theatricality. Let's go back in time to see what preceded his turn dot. Yevgeny had been fascinated by theater since he was little and never wanted any other career than to be an actor and stage director. However, following his father's wishes, his father owned a tobacco factory in Vladikavkaz, Yevgeny entered Moscow State University, where he studied natural sciences and then law. However, simultaneously, Vakhtangov also acted in directed theater in hobby groups. In 1904, he was accepted to Adashev's acting school, there, Vakhtangov studied the Stanislavsky method with Leopold Sulejitsky and other great actors of the Moscow Art Theater. In 1911, he was accepted to work in the Moscow Art Theater. Vakhtangov's acting career there proved to be not that significant, with him only playing tiny roles here and there. But his big break came in 1913, when the Moscow Art Theater opened its first studio and Vakhtangov became a stage director. Theatrical studios, as an alternative to major theaters, enjoyed great popularity at that time in Russia and Europe. August Strindberg's Intimate Theater and Max Reinhardt's Kammerspiele served as models. Stanislavski was open to experiments and eager to improve his method by means of such studios. In 1905, uh, Sevilov Meyerhold tried to stage a few performances in the Moscow Art Theater studio. However, Stanislavski didn't like these experiments and so Meyerhold's productions were never seen and the studio closed down. Moscow Art Theater's first studio was led by Leopold Sulejitsky, shortly called Sule. He was a follower of Tolstoy and student of Stanislavski. Sule advocated the Stanislavski <coughs> method and he made it the first studio's main goal to use Stanislavski method in its production. As a brief reminder, Stanislavski developed the internal acting technique. According to his approach, an actor needs to live a character's life and strive to become the character. However, this system was far more complicated than that, but there is no time to go into detail right now. For the moment, what should be kept in mind is that it was an internal acting technique where a character's internal truth was much more important than the form of expression. Vachtangov staged four productions in the first studio. 
they were. You heard how comes the coming of peace in 1913, Henningberger's the Deluge in 1915, Henrik Ibsen's Rosmanholm in 1918, and August Trimberg's Eric the Fourteenth in 1921. It's important to, to note that in addition to the first studio, Vakhtangov also made productions in other theaters and studios of Moscow. For instance, in his own studio, which formed in 1913. This studio later became the Moscow Art Theater's third studio in 1920, and even later Vakhtangov's theater in 1926, which today remains one of the Moscow's major theaters. Even though Vakhtangov only produced 10 performances on the professional stage, it won't be possible to cover all of his work in this lecture. What is strikingly relevant is not the number of productions he did, but rather the fact that Vakhtangov had a unique approach with each of them. His method evolved radically over the years. Vakhtangov's artistic development is extremely interesting and yet also quite hard to trace. He moved from being an advocate for Stanislavski's method of realism to experimenting in radical avant-garde theater, and then toward the end of his life in the early 1920s he became fascinated with Mark Hoyt. Vakhtangov's initial performance at the first studio was Hauptmann's The Coming of Peace, staged in 1913. It's a naturalistic play subtitled A Family Catastrophe. It concerns a tortured relationship within a family. At one point, there is hope for peace but it turns out to be merely illusion and that no happy result will be found. Yet the play has a larger subtext. This family situation was projected over the entire culture. The deeper meaning is what Vakhtangov struggled to bring to the surface. His teacher, Suler, tried to push Vakhtangov toward a more optimistic interpretation and pressed him to emphasize the good inside people and their intention to make peace. But Vakhtangov confronted Suler and instead went his own way. He, his deeply pessimistic interpretation followed the family catastrophes found in Dostoevsky's works. His extreme, the, uh, his extreme performance was filled with pain, anguish, nervous anger, and protest instead of reconciliation. Vakhtangov's motto at that time was to drive out theater from the theater, drive out an actor, costumes, and makeup from the play. Everything had to be natural. Actors became their characters, which in turn ended up with naturalism ruling the stage. The scenery was very simple and minimalist, the stage and the auditorium were divided by a canvas curtain, but it's worth noting that there was no stage as such. The first row of the audience was on the same level as the stage, so the spectators felt co-present with what happened on stage. In some cases, audience members became hysterical during the performances because of their strong reactions to what was happening on stage. Stanislavski didn't approve this production, even for a man like him who loved the imitation of real life on stage. It was too much, too extreme. So Vakhtangov's performance was a failure. Next was Berger's The Deluge in 1915. This Vakhtangov at this time. Vakhtangov chose the play attempting to follow the direction of the first studio which focused on examining of a person's soul and pursuing not only aesthetical goals, but also ethical ones. The play's action occurs in an American bar during deluge. All kinds of people are gathered in this bar, from a broke stockbroker to a black servant. 
In the second act, the horror of their approaching death unites them, makes them humane again. At this time, the power of money and mechanization of life but by capitalistic civilization recede into the background. But during the third act, the characters learn that the danger of deluge was false and their alarm was in vain. The second act's reconciliation is revealed to be an illusion. This turns the people into strangers and enemies. Once again, Bakhtanga differed from his teacher, Suler, by making denunciation and not reconciliation more important. What mattered to him was not the second act, but the third. In this production, the approach became sharp, satirical, and grotesque. One of Bakhtanga's significant achievements was that he managed to create a great ensemble of actors. Both Vahtangov and Michael Chekhov played the role of Fraser in this performance. This Vahtangov is Fraser, and this is Michael Chekhov. Their approaches to this role were rather different, but there is no time to detail this right now. Suler died in 1916, so Vahtangov staged Ibsen's Rosmer Hoy without his supervision. Its opening night took place in 1918. While Vakhtangov was working on this production, the revolution of 1917 happened, which greatly affected him. Being swept up in the period's mood of great change, Vakhtangov was drawn to generalization. No wonder he chose a symbolic play by Ibsen. Here's Bakhtangov as Brendel in Rosmer's home. Stanislavski colleague Vladimir Nemirovich Daichenko staged Rosmer Holm at the Moscow Art Theater in 1908, and it proved to be a failure. Bakhtangov wrote that the main reason why Ibsen suffers is that he's not being taken from the perspective of huge images like boulders. Bakhtangov staged Rosmer's Holm as if, if it were not a drama, but a tragedy. His Rebecca manifested a spirit of revolution, and she infected Rosmer with her fire. Bakhtangov wrote that they, were, they went to meet death happily. Their suicide was seen as a victory over life, over old Rosmer's Holm. Their death became an overcoming, an escape to an abstract non-existence. In Rosmer's Holm, Bakhtangov put an end to the internal acting technique. His actors reached a profoundly deep psychological truth in their characters, whereas the external manifestation of the characters remained very restrained. The actors used very limited gestures by offered extremely expressive looks and instead relied on the power of words. Bakhtangov transferred the exterior word into the human soul. His next step would be a mystery play or expressionism, and Bakhtangov made this step by staging Strindberg's Eric de Putin in 1921. After Rosmer's home, Bakhtangov reconsidered his views. He started protesting the Moscow Art Theater's naturalism. He objected to Stanislavski's statement, the spectator must forget that he's in the theater and that the audience come not to see a performance of Uncle Vanya, but to visit Uncle Vanya. Vaktangov now stood opposed to the theater of a keyhole, so to speak, where the audience have to be peeping at life on stage or precisely as an imitation of life. Bakhtangov radically changed his motto from to drive away theater out of the theater to the spectator must not forget for a second that, that he is in the theater. Bakhtangov wanted to return theater into the theater. Now he sought not the truth of life on stage, but a theatrical truth. 
in other words, truth shown by theatrical means. He coined the term fantastic realism. This means that he still stuck to realism on stage, but it needed to be a realism as fantasized by an artist. From the internal acting, te act acting technique, Bakhtangov came to the external acting technique where the full form of expression became most important. It didn't mean that he completely rejected Stanislavski's method, but rather that he modified it. There was still psychological truth as a goal of his approach to a character. But instead of living a character's life, the actor stepped out of a character and alienation took place. An actor performed not just the character, but also his opinion of the character. From the core of a character, Vakhtangov moved to the core of an actor. And Michael Chekhov, who participated in Vakhtangov's productions, played the role of Eric the Fourteen in particular, was his soulmate and shared his ideas. Usually, Vakhtangov never published any written comments about his productions in the press. However, with Eric, he broke this pattern. He anticipated his new experiment's vulnerability and sought to protect, protect it from unimportant accusations. He wrote a pu and published an article in which he explained his interpretation of Stringer's play and his intentions as its stage director. In Eric, Vakhtangov emphasized the artistic activation of an actor instead of the unachievable and fruitless approach of becoming a character by living a character's life. Vakhtangov wanted his audience not to forget that they were in theater. What was the performance about? Vakhtangov gave a clear explanation of his vision of Strindberg's play in his article. He foregrounded the play's expressionistic motives. He inserted the outside world into Eric's soul and focused the performance not so much on the surrounding reality, but rather on the king's inner world. Nevertheless, Vakhtangov didn't restrain himself by only showing the inner drama of Eric. Bakhtangov's production needed to be viewed within the prism of radical transformation of epochs, which accompanied the Russia during the revolution. In Eric, Bakhtangov showed the old world's downfall. As a manifestation of this theme, he revealed the perpetual doom of royal power. It didn't matter who held the throne, the atmosphere surrounding it would always be unhealthy. In the performance, after Eric has been dethroned and his brother Johann the Third has risen to the throne to the reef of funereal sounds, according to Vakhtangov, an executioner was already waiting behind the throne. In Vakhtangov's interpretation, Eric was not simply the Swedish historical king but a generalized image, a metaphor for royal power combined with the disastrous fate of an individual. Bakhtangov wrote about Eric, an ardent poet, sharp mathematician, sensitive artist, an unbridled dreamer who is doomed to be a king. In Eric, Bakhtangov succeeded in combining clear and deeply philosophical thought with a sharply defined external form. Two words stand in direct contrast in Bakhtangov's performance, the palace world and the world of simple people. Bakhtangov applied his new experimental approach to the palace world. This world was extremely abstract, immobile, and laconic. It was replete with naive symbols, like an allegory. Its courtiers had pale mask-like faces and appeared as if dead. In opposition to the, wor uh, the world of simple people, like Mons, Kirin, Max was clearly 
very much alive, concrete, and realistic. Ignat Nijinsky created the performance's scenery. When the curtains opened, the first thing to strike the audience were huge bolts of lightning with sharp angles against a black backdrop. Then they pointed to the tragic finale. Tilted columns stained with gold and rusty bronze also functioned as omens of death. Together they established an atmosphere of decline. The palace resembled a prison with a labyrinth of passages, stairways, and platforms. The stage itself was broken apart. A physical detail audience of the period found very hard to accept. It's much more interesting to discuss the palace world than the common people's world. Let's take a look at the picture of the Dowager Queen whose role was played by Serafima Birman. She had a pale face, seeming closed eyes, dense eyebrows, tightly closed lips, and one grotesquely arched eyebrow. Her image was cubistic and seemed grotesque with her curved theatrical collar. Her body was straight, yet she nonetheless rushed around the palace like a bat. She impersonated prickly malice. But let's focus on Eric, as played by Michael Chekhov. When the curtain rose and the audience saw the bolts of lightning, they also heard Eric laughing off stage. His laughter spanned an, a complex range of feelings. First, it resembled a child's carefree laughter. Then, it became tamed by triumph. And then, suddenly, by a sharp irony, which evolved into anxiety, fear, and then into anger and malice. This was followed by a rumbling of a satanic, cruel cackling, Eric's laughter at himself. When Eric appeared on stage, the audience could see bloody bolts of lightning on his mantle, as well as on the backdrop. Eric raised his hand as if wanting to give an order, but right afterward forgot about his hand, as if he had suddenly become paralyzed. Eric's whole role was established out of contrast just as was the entire performance. Chekhov embodied Bakhtangov's characterization of Eric. He's sometimes angry, sometimes tender, sometimes arrogant, sometimes simple, sometimes protesting, sometimes submissive, believing in God and Satan, sometimes recklessly unjust, sometimes recklessly merciful sometimes geniusly clever, sometimes helpless and confused, sometimes instantly decisive, sometimes slow and doubting, God and hell, fire and water, lord and slave. He is dying, unable to overcome such contradictions. Bakhtangov changed the finale of Stringer's play, which, as you may recall, was left open-ended. In Bakhtangov's version, Eric poisoned himself. Before doing so, he removed his mantle and other regalia of power and remained in a monk-like black outfit. Then he became immersed in contemplating, motionlessly standing by his throne as the courtiers dashed around him. One more picture, Michael Chekhov. By showing the heightened anxiety in, of Eric's palace, Vakhtangov revealed the anxiety of Moscow in the years following the revolution. The performance reflected the spirit of Moscow in 1980s, 20s years, its devastation and economic uncertainty. Vakhtangov's Eric was the scream of a person trapped between worlds. As we saw at the beginning of this presentation, Vakhtangov overcame his desperate feeling 
and moved toward a hope for a better future and brought his method of fantastic realism to full completion in his last production of Foreign Dog. It was a performance of the Moscow Art Theater's first studio, which later became Vartangov Theater. However, Vartangov never got to see this because shortly after Kerenbot's great success, he died at the age of 39. To this day, Vartangov remains a legendary figure in Russian theater. To conclude my presentation, I would like to show you a fragment of the reconstruction of Princess Turandot made by Vartangov. The reconstruction was made in 1963 by Vartangov student Ruben Simonov, and the performance was filmed in 1971. Simonov was not exactly accurate, so his reconstruction is not an exact copy of the original performance. And for Vartangov, it was important to show actors of a small Venice theater troupe playing Carla Gotts' turn dot on stage. So the main device of the performance was theater within theater. For Simonov, who did the reconstruction, it was not the main focus. For him, the focus was the irony of actors. Therefore, for Canadia de Art, the characters became very important in this production. They were making jokes and performing various pranks on stage in a way which was understandable for the contemporary audience. So for us today, it might look a little bit old-fashioned and maybe even silly, but let's try imagine what the audience from 1963, almost half of a century ago, could, would have experienced during this performance. I will show the opening of performance and will give little comments. So imagine Moscow in 1922 with the economic crisis, famine, people poorly dressed, and they see this wonderful, light, festive performance. That's called the period of actors. In the middle, we see Turin Knot. that it's just a performance, that they're in the theater. But later he gave up on this idea, but Simonov fulfilled. And now they're singing introductory song inviting the audience to participate in the performance. And you can see the details of costumes made of pieces of material. And characters of media that are to say that it's us and say their names. You see Pantalone and Trufaldina and Tartaglia and Regella. And at this time, it was the most popular Russian ballet in Russia, so the reference was obvious. And Tartali is doing a little swan dance. It's not a 
whole performance, but you got the spirit and the atmosphere. And now we go back to the slide showing Vakhtangov's performance of 1922 and Vakhtangov's actors saying goodbye. So that's all. And I'm eager to answer any questions you might have. This seems a lot like uh, Bertolt Brecht's going yeah. to work um, in epic theater, uh, which he got from Piscotter. Do you know if there was any relationship between Piscotter and this production of? Uh, well, probably Bertolt? there was. I didn't know whether Wachtangov knew about Piscotter, but Bertolt Brecht, the alienation device, and it was Wachtangov's last, because he evolved during the time he made production. But at the last stage of his life and his work, he used this device when it's like a double playing. An actor is playing an actor and at the same time playing with a character. So this alienation, it will be um, close to what Brecht was doing. I know one of the things that's important is that this production got a lot of write up and uh, everybody read about it, and, and Brett did read about it. I don't know if he actually saw it. Um, but his, his complaint about Vektanov was he loved everything Vektanov did, except he felt it wasn't political enough. But okay. that may be because the earlier productions that were more political, Brett didn't hear about. Yeah. Um, where he just thought this one didn't make a strong enough political statement. Yeah. But everything else, I think he, he just sort of stole. Well, um, hmm. Revolution of 1917 affected Vakhtangov in a huge way. Yeah. Like, one day he would go out uh, outside on the street and he saw the worker, a simple worker, um, repairing the wires. And he saw the hands of this worker, and he came back to the theater, and he's like, yeah, I feel revolution. I saw those hands of a single worker. I accept it. And he had huge plans to stage Bible, the story of Moses, where he leads people, and he wanted to stage a play without any main characters, just a crowd of people revolting. No words, just a crowd of people. And he just accepted it. And I don't think he accepted it. I'm afraid to be wrong with my language, but mentally, but more aesthetically. Mm -hmm. Aesthetically, it's affected him a lot. And he probably, and he died before the result of revolution came. And it was apparently what Marhoit realized later because Marhoit accepted the revolution with, with fascination. So, but for Vakhtangov, I think it was more aesthetically and maybe his performances were not that politically, um, that politically manifested, but he definitely was trying doing that. But turned off that stands a part of everything he did before. And maybe the sense that he was dying and he was on the edge with between life and death. It was just theatrical triumph. Nothing political. Just triumph. And but that what what uh, the audience needed at this time. They were poorly dressed, starving, no hope for a better future, and they see this triumph of theater. And they forget about their surroundings for three hours. So in the mem memoirs of the audience members, that it was just a miracle. It was just something from a different life. But I mean, maybe it was in a way a political statement to give people hope. Yeah, but it's fascinating that you know, throughout the history of theater, there's been this struggle between whether theater has to be socially relevant in some way, or whether it just has to be something that takes people into another world. Yeah. And, and there's, I, mean, I think now we, we're tending to really overkill the social relevance part of it um, without remembering that there are alternatives to that. 
Well, that could also be considered, and this was certainly one of those alternatives that was remarkably successful. Uh, it reminds me of, of Bill Ball's production of Tame of the Shrew, where he did it with Camille Dalarte characters, and it's uh, a similar kind of, of approach to theater that is just delightful to see, and it does take you away from, from the everyday stress of political turmoil that, or social turmoil in your, in your culture. Yeah. Really interesting. Is there, and I mean, I think this, what, what you're talking about is sort of getting towards this idea, but do you have a, a theory or a thought or is there anything written down about what kind of prompted th th this huge stylistic change for, um, for him? Was, do you think it was, uh, you know, a, a result of the political surroundings or if it was just made personal? I think it's a complex of circumstances. First, Wachtang was a true um, student of Stanislavski and did everything just to follow Stanislavski method. But, and I tried to um, deliver it in my presentation that he reached the end point. He didn't, he reached this realism becoming naturalism of stage. There was no next step. And the re revolution happened, which turned the whole situation in the country upside down. And he, uh, and I think Michael Chekhov, his cooperation with Michael Chekhov, because Michael Chekhov played an important part in his artistic development. He was a student of Stanislavski, Michael Chekhov. And maybe you know the story, he almost ended up in a mental asylum because he was living a character's life. And he did it so intensively that he almost became crazy. And he had to stop performing for a while, take some time off, and he reconsidered his acting method. And he started improvising, imagining a character, and trying to leave. He would write in his diary, let's, for example, Don Quixote. What would he eat for breakfast? What would he wear? How would he make gestures? And create this imaginary image and then perform this image on stage. Whereas Stanislavski was saying, remember situations from your past and try to go back in your past and leave the situations on stage. So there was completely another approach in Michael's channel method. And together with Vachtanga, they developed this theatricality and this fantastic realism. When it's realism, but it's fantasized by an artist. So. I'm curious if you could say something about um, how you did your research to, you talked about reading audience memoirs and see that you looked at um, photographs and design elements, but I'm also curious if your own training as a performer, you know, has you somehow able to, you know, give a sense of embodiment in your research, and if that has... You mean my ballet class? Mm -hmm. Of course, and it influenced me. But um, to be a ballet dancer and a researcher, it's different things. Like, I quit ballet, and I started writing reviews for a newspaper before I entered the university. And for two years, I could not see the production. I was looking at the ballet steps. My body was hurting because I would do it differently. I want to change this, 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 but I didn't see the larger picture. So a researcher needs to have distance from, from acting technique, from steps and movements, and it took me a while. So going back to your question, of course it helps me. My ballet career in the past helps me to see the body movements and theatricality. And um, I read a lot about Bakhtanga. His students wrote memoirs where they would describe how he worked, what would he say, how he led the rehearsals. And the great book, the collection of all of the reviews written on Bakhtanga's works, 
came out in Russia two years ago. And for example, Eric the Putin's, there are like 100 reviews. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing that reporters at this time, they didn't get what he wanted. They didn't get his intentions. They thought that was too radical, too new, too crazy, that Eric was mentally sick. One review wrote that Eric was like the um, word number six, the Chekhov story about mental asylum, that Michael Chekhov was a character for this story, that he was completely crazy, with crazy makeup, and absolutely mad on stage. So in it's interesting, but um, the collection of reviews goes from the time of the production and later when the performance was on tour in some European countries and some European reviews wrote about it. And with the passage of time, you can see that people start to grab the idea. They start to understand the idea better with the passage of time. But that's the destiny of innovators. They're not received right away in, I think, many cases. Thank you. Those of you who need to go, please feel free to leave. And, and those of you who want to stay and ask a few more questions, we'll have another five minutes for questions, and then we'll, we'll let Marie um, get back to her work. Anybody else have a question? Oh, I just have one question. It was about the makeup, um, and you did sort of mention it. Um, was Vatara, did he develop that, that style of makeup and put it on, on the actors, or is that was there another artist responsible for doing that? Well, they worked together with Niewinski, who made the costumes and stage design, so I think they developed. But I know that Michael uh, Chekhov participated in the developing of makeup, and his makeup, he, he participated. It's very yeah. strange. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs>